Hey there, welcome back to the podcast. This is Holy Post Podcast. I'm Phil Vischer. I am here with Caitlin Schess once again. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Phil. And uh, Sky Jatani. Are you still here, Sky? Hey, everyone. Hi, Sky. Uh, what's one interesting thing that's happened in your life, Sky, in the last two weeks? One interesting thing. One, I, I'm not prepared for that. I didn't think about that. Um, one interesting thing. Yeah. I got nothing. Okay, forget it. Caitlin, one interesting thing that happened in the last two weeks. Come on. Um, I, I'm going to brag. Is that okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. I won this systematic theology award at my seminary. What? And that was just a really big deal for me. It was a surprise. So that was really exciting. What okay, what does that even mean? You have the best systematic theology of anyone at your seminary? I definitely yeah, don't think work? they would say that. So that was not what it was. Okay. Um, I think what it was, was just it? they picked the the best student in systematic theology. Oh, wow. Okay. So you because you're always there first thing in the morning and you clean the <laughs> erasers and you help the teacher pass out the handouts. That's probably and, what it is. Uh, yeah. Does yeah. Am I close? Am I close? <laughs> does the that real, come with like real... a cash prize, like the Nobel? <laughs> it does. Oh, yeah. Cash prize, cash prize. <gasps> It does, oh. and here's but but here's the real big deal. It's not that the real big deal is there are like no women in this department, and so that was like win for the women. Wow, wow, that seems like worth commemorating on a T-shirt in some way. <laughs> Maybe behind the scenes campus. they were saying, "Hey, listen, if we give her this award, we don't have to ordain her." Yeah, and then she, and, and maybe she'll <laughs> stop complaining. <laughs> Cynical. Ouch. You guys are so cynical. And cynical. No, no, no. I, actually, it, it was no sorry. doubt completely well earned. Oh, yeah. I know you deserve it. The, the, you were not surprised a, that you got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How's your, how's your job at the church going? Oops, never mind. Okay, here's the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian. Hey, Sky, did you think of something interesting that happened in the last two weeks? Yes, I'm looking at my calendar. I got fully vaccinated. That I am, is fantastic. I am now 100% yes, being tracked by Bill Gates. I thought I saw you glowing just a, <laughs> mm -hmm. just a, a tiny bit. I got I'm half vaccinated, which means I only have to cover half my face with my mask now, and I can have the other <laughs> half uncovered. No, right, like what the you, Phantom of the Opera. No, what do you do? What do you mean, Caitlin? No, I don't have you're to have any of it covered. Is that what you're saying? No mask. <laughs> Fake news. Okay, um, actually, here's my interesting thing for the last two weeks. We have a burrow in our backyard that our, one of our dogs is absolutely obsessed with, and our dog has been skunked multiple times. So we figure, okay, we got a skunk living under this brown shed in our backyard. So we call the people and we trap and relocate this skunk, you know, put them in our neighbor's yard. We don't care. Just move them down the street. <laughs> Come and trap the skunk. So they, they set a trap for the skunk. They put in the skunk bait. We wait at night. Nothing happens. I have to check it by law in Illinois. I have to check it by law by 8 a.m. every morning if it's a nocturnal animal. If we're trapping a nocturnal animal, it is against the law to not check it by 8 a.m. every morning. That's something you didn't know. So I check it. There's nothing there. And the next morning, I come out to check it. I hear a weird little chirping sound. I'm like, what? And it's coming from the general direction of the trap area. So I think, what, did we trap a bird? Did we trap a quail or some I'm, weird... I know what you didn't trap. What? A Polish croissant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sky. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. And I go up there. I'm looking at, what is it? What? There's something in there. Is it a squirrel? Is it a big... Is it a groundhog? What? And no, it was a coyote pup. We trapped a baby coyote in our skunk trap, and it was barking for its mother. Aww. And those little chirps were barked. So I had to let, so I'm like, what is he doing here? Is it, is there a coyote 
living in the burrow and I trapped one of her pups. This is terrible. So I let the coyote pup go, go hoping that he'll find his mother, you know, somehow and they'll have a reunion and run through the weeds and hug and everything will be good. And I'll, so I call the guys and say, I don't, I don't think, is, could there be a coyote living in that burrow? So they send another guy out and he looks at it and says, no, it's not big enough. He says, sometimes skunks will dig a burrow and then move out. And then an, a, a possum will move in and enlarge the burrow and they'll move out. And then a raccoon or a fox will move in to a bigger burrow. But that's not big enough for a, uh, a, a coyote. And, but look, there's rabbit fur next to the entrance to the burrow. So you've probably got a raccoon or a fox in there. And I'm thinking, well, then why did we trap a baby coyote? <laughs> so, so they set a new trap. It's a bigger trap because this is a bigger animal. We come back the next day. It's been triggered. The bait is gone, but it's empty. So something was smart enough to get into it, get the bait, wow. get out of it, trigger it. Yeah, I don't know. So I don't know what it is. And I don't. And every time they come out to reset the trap, it's 80 bucks. So I'm like, we can't do this every day. This I think we know who's, I think we know who's taking the bait then. No, this wait. It sounds like you are, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> so, so we're sitting around the next day and my, my daughter, my oldest daughter is sitting at the kitchen table and looks out the window and says, look, a fox. And there was a fox coming out of the burrow as we were looking. So there's a fox living under there. I still have no idea why we trapped a coyote pup if we've got a, a right outside the front door of a fox burrow. And that you're doesn't sure, make any sense. You're sure it was a coyote pup? Yeah, I, I Googled it. And I looked, I Googled fox kit because that's what a coyote, a fox pup is, a kit. Uh -huh. I Googled fox kit, which is not a kit to build your own fox out of Legos. It's a baby fox. And I compared them and it, it, it looked like a puppy. I mean, you could have put it in a pet store. <laughs> You could have put it in a pet store and people would have said, oh, the puppy, and they would have taken it home and then it would have grown up and killed their cat. So anyway, <laughs> that's what's going on in my backyard. It's like Wild Kingdom. One day we looked out like two weeks ago and there was a fox, I guess the fox now, we know that he's our fox, walking <laughs> through our front yard, carrying in his mouth a wild turkey. A wild turkey in his mouth. Wow. In what kind of yard. sound does he make? The wild turkey? He yeah, was no, dead. the fox. The fox. fox, what does the fox do, you know what, do you know what sound fox? Do you know what the fox says? Huh. Sky, do you know what the fox says? I no one does, Phil. Foxes scream. They have what? a bark that sounds like a scream. You Google Google fox scream and you will on YouTube and you'll see videos of foxes screaming. Because we've been hearing it at night and it drives our dogs crazy because they know what it is and they want to go get it. All right, hold on. Okay. So that was pretty interesting, huh? Almost as interesting as getting your second vaccination. Oh, <laughs> I guess. Are you looking it up, Sky? Yeah, it's coming through my headphones. Oh, do you hear it? Do you hear it? Hear no one's screaming yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Jason can add a fox scream here. Holy cow. Oh, oh yeah. Sky just startled. Hold on. We'll add it. Jason, add, add a fox scream. Oh, my god! So we've gosh. been hearing that. It's weird, huh? Very. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I'm like, what the heck? What the heck is that? Is that it's a chupacabra. Chupacabra. <laughs> no, it's a fox scream. A screaming, a turkey eating, screaming, under my, my uh, shed living fox that our larger dog really wants to play with and or kill. I'm not sure which. Um, the Col our, our favorite Colorado baker has been sued again. Did you hear about this? I did. Yeah. Uh, this time involving a birthday cake for a transgender woman who requested a cake that was blue on the outside and pink on the inside in honor of her gender transition. And he said, no, I will not bake a cake that is blue on the outside and pink on the inside because I know what it means. This to me seems slightly different than saying, I, I don't want to participate in your wedding ceremony. Doesn't it seem a little uh, different? It does, but I don't think legally it is because I think if I recall in the wedding ceremony, the same-sex wedding ceremony case, the argument put forth by the attorney for the baker was one of freedom of expression. It wasn't about freedom of religion. In other words, mm. To bake yeah, a cake that okay. expresses an idea that the baker doesn't agree with would be government imposing or limiting his freedom of speech. And okay. that sounds like what's so going on does, here. Yeah, okay. 
is it really, are you really making a statement if you make a pink cake and put blue frosting on it? That's not the point. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, what if you came take, in and said... Take transgender stuff, or take anything out of this. If, if, if someone comes into your cake shop and says, I want you to make a cake that looks like a frog, and you say, I don't make cakes that look like frogs because I hate frogs, yeah. you can't be sued by the government because it's, it's an act of expression, right? It, doesn't, it has nothing to do with uh, okay. you know, yeah. religion. But what, or, if, what if – go ahead. But if you if, – if you, Will you bake a blue cake? Oh, yeah, we'll bake a blue cake. No, sorry, we'll bake a pink cake. Sure, totally, we do that for gender reveals all the time. Do you have blue icing? Oh, yeah, we have blue icing. Will you put the blue icing on the pink cake? Absolutely not. That right. Seems, that seems a little weird. Like if you just said, oh, we're having a birthday party and our colors are blue and pink, so can we have a pink cake with blue icing? You'd say, oh, sure. So something, it's not the same as saying we don't make frog cakes. That's not the same, Sky. I that's true. That's, that's okay. true. Caitlin, Caitlin, weigh in. Tell us who's who's right. Who won? Did I win? I think I won, didn't I? I, I mean, I, I feel a little bit like you won, but I, here's the thing. I, I am all for there being protections. I am all for there being protections for people, religious freedom protections, freedom of expression protections. What I wish wasn't happening in a lot of these cases was... One, it feels orchestrated on both ends, right? Like I'm going to go ask for this kind of cake from yeah. this kind of person. Mm-hmm. To orga- but but more than that on the Christian side, because again, right. I, I care more about what, what the Christians are doing is like, wouldn't it just be great though, that even if you had the legal protection to not make the cake, you just made the cake because you, you know, you know that you're not going to show up at this person's party and have to say anything you don't believe in, or you're not going to have to pledge allegiance to some creed that you don't agree with. You just have to make a cake. Could we just not make some cakes when we don't have to make it a big deal. And then, then we wouldn't seem like we're being constantly the ones that just want to make a fight out of it. Yeah. I, and I've written some pieces along those lines where I, I argue a Christian should make the cake. I'm not opposed to the cake making and Phil, you're probably right. right. Like if, if this baker had a policy of we don't make pink cakes with blue frosting for everybody, then they right. would have a, a legal standing probably to, to deny it to this person because there is no explicit message just in the colors to express you know right. something he disagrees right. with. It could so, be, a, it could be a, a gender reveal cake that's just going to be a surprise because it's blue on the outside, but then you cut into it and you say, oh, just kidding, it was a girl. Right, you right. Know, and say, okay, you can use this cake for that, but you can't use this cake for yeah. that. Right. That That's like, little... it's very ambiguous. The message, the, the communication is <clears throat> ambiguous, which is kind of ironic, ambiguous. but, uh, right. Good, good word. So in that regard, I would agree, but I, I think Caitlin's right. Like I, there's a difference between looking at these issues through the lens of a Christian versus looking at them through the lens of an American who stands for constitutional rights and limited government. So depending on which hat I'm wearing at the time is going to defend how I interpret what's going on. As a Christian, I would say just make the friggin' cake. Make this friggin' cake. It's just a cake. That's not going to kill you. It, but but it's now it's it's a symbol of the culture war, and we feel like we're losing the culture war. So to to give you know, it's like what I would still Why say, we? make the friggin' cake. Make a friggin' cake. Make the table flipping cake. That's, That's right. my, new Christ- <laughs> my new Christian swear. Okay. Um, our friend David French wrote a piece on Sunday that got a lot of people talking. It was kind of interesting. I thought we'd bring it up. Uh, the title is The Question That Dictates How Christians Approach Culture and Politics. He says there's one question, um, and he, he, he believes that question is, that is worth discussing, is does the primary threat to the church that we perceive come from within or without. And here's how he describes it. He says, it's, it's becoming increasingly obvious that one explana- explanation for profoundly different Christian approaches to politics and culture rests with different answers to the following question. Does the primary threat to the church come from within the church or without? Put differently, does the church stumble and fall primarily because of the sins of the church or because of the cultural and political headwinds directed against the church? Um, and then he brings up as an example, 
you know, uh, Rod Dreher and, and some of uh, the writing on Rod Dreher's and, and we generally like, we, we just, we've disagreed with some of Rod Dreher, but we also like some of Rod Dreher. I interact with him on Twitter. Um, his blog is often, David French says, a clearinghouse for Christians who express dark fears about the future of the church and the Republic. And there was one example of a father writing in and saying, I've done all these steps to protect my kids from the culture. All of these, I've done everything. They had no technology. They had no non-Christian friends. They, had, they were homeschooled. You know, they, they were on leashes whenever they were outside. They had ankle bracelets. They, they, and yet, you know, one of my kids has gone astray and has lost their faith and is considering an LGBTQ identity. And, you know, so all is lost. What did I do wrong? And, and they're baking and, uh, pink cakes with their blue frosting. <laughs> they're baking pink or blue cakes with pink frosting or cakes where it's all blended together and you can't even tell what it is. And uh, David French's perspective is that that sin, you know, if we're in a classical reform tradition, sin is on the inside of all of us. You know, we're all depraved. And even if you lock us in closets for our whole childhoods, we're still going to figure out how to sin, how to mess up. So he thinks the focus is is wrong to say, you know, the world is is the biggest threat to the church. He believes we are the biggest threat to the church. Thoughts, Caitlin? Thoughts? You you read this piece. What do you think? I really liked it. I do think, though, that there's kind of, I don't want to go so far as to say there's a more important question, but I think there's a secondary question that helps make sense of this, too, because I do think actually both more progressive Christians and more conservative Christians, right, however you want to kind of define the two sides, both see problems in the church and problems in the world, and both have different kinds of problems in the church and the world they think are the most important. Like I think more progressive Christians or, or even just more, you know, less conservative Christians who are trying to deal with problems in the church also see problems in the world. They want to see justice. They want to see, you know, the poor taking care of those kinds of things. So that question is helpful on some level, but I actually think maybe another question that needs to be asked with it is, are we fundamentally for or against the world? Like, are we, is it an us versus them kind of thing where those of us who are in the church, the world is against us. And so we are also against it. Or do we have a sense of the way Christ was, the world is against me, but I am still for the sake for the life of the world, regardless of kind of whether you see big problems in the church or whether you see big problems in the world. If you think that part of what it means to be the church in this period, while we wait for Christ's return is to seek the flourishing of the larger communities that you're in. If you think the world is something that Christ is coming to redeem, condemn, yes, but ultimately redeem, then that changes both the problems you see in the church and in the world instead of it just being, we will always be against them because they are always against us. Instead, it's, we will have to sacrifice things because the world will be against us. They will hate you like they hated me, Jesus says, but also then he goes on to sacrifice himself for the sake of the world. If we have that mentality, then that changes, I think, how we deal with the problems in the church and the problems outside, quote unquote outside, because they're always a little bit mixed, but both in and outside the church. Um, I I love David French's piece. I, I couldn't agree more with it. I think if I were to... Uh, if I were to write a follow-up to that, I think the, another way of framing the issue is not just, do you see the primary threat from inside or outside the church? But what's the difference between the way conservatives and progressives, Christians, I mean, how do they see evil being defeated? What's the order that things happen in? So what comes to mind is in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talks about that we are to remove the log from our own eye before we... Are, can see clear enough to remove the speck from our brothers. And it's all about hypocrisy and, you know, don't just judge others, look at yourself. But I think in that, in that real core biblical truth is a deeper mystery about the way God himself goes about redeeming the world and, and ra eradicating evil and threats. So I'd argue that the gospel way, Jesus way of dealing with evil is from the inside out. And think about the progression of his own redemptive story, right? It, I would say the beginning of, of Jesus' defeat of evil happens in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's wrestling with his father and finally says, not my will, but your will be done. There is this internal surrender that Jesus has to the will of God. That's where the victory begins. So it starts internally. Then it moves bodily where he 
exercises that victory through his own body on his death on the cross. Then it becomes communal or cultural, where after his resurrection, this victory is embodied in a people, in a community, which is the church, which operates differently than the evil of the world. It creates a new culture that operates based on Jesus' ethic and the kingdom of God. And finally, at the end of history, you get the victory cosmically where Jesus comes and finally defeats every enemy, including death, and all is made right, and everything that's against God is thrown out of the city, and everything that is of God is welcomed into the city. So it's in to out. It's internal, bodily, cultural or communal, and then finally cosmic. And I would say that a lot of the American church, and I think this is what David French was getting at, reverses that order. They think the way evil is ultimately defeated is first by the cosmic defeat of our external enemies. First, we need to separate everyone in the world into you're against us or you're for us. And only then do we manifest that victory in our body um, or culturally, meaning now we need to dominate the culture, dominate everyone to make sure they're externally conformed to what we say is right. Third, then it's bodily. I'm going to manifest this victory through tattoos and symbols and, you know, Jesus t-shirts and everything that I show on my own personhood. And finally, maybe I have an internal sense of victory over evil, which is really just my self-righteous smugness that comes from realizing I'm on the winning team. So it's external in rather than internal out. And, and that's the problem. I think we'd all agree there are definite evils out in the world and there are evils inside the church. The question is, what's the solution? Which direction do you go? I think that's the fundamental difference. Well, that was interesting. Wasn't that interesting, Caitlin? That was interesting. Yeah, she's nodding. She thinks that was interesting. Okay, here's my question. Because <laughs> I want to back up because because David French's question is, and um, uh, Daniel Darling, who's been on the show uh, before and, and was did work for Russell Moore at the ERLC and is now the head of communications for the National Religious Broadcasters, wrote a piece in response to David French's piece where he's saying, well, it it's, can't be just one or the other threat from the outside or threat from the inside. You know, the world is a threat. We're supposed to keep ourselves clean from the world. And there's internal stuff. My And, and so, yeah, I see that point. My question is, and I don't know, maybe it's just me. Why are we talking about threat so much? Right. I just, it, it feels to me like we're living after the ascension, but f before Pentecost, you know, it feels like we're all, we're all huddled in the upper room with the door locked saying they're coming for us. They're coming for us. They're coming for us. You know, we're not safe and that we've stopped there. We've frozen and forget that 50 days later, boom, the Holy Spirit. Bam, they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they become fearless. And there's like no talk of threat. You know, there's, I mean, there's disagreements over theology. There's, you know, Paul and Peter get in an argument about Judaism and different stuff happens. People get arrested, people get killed, but there, it doesn't seem to be any language of threat. Like, look out, everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's, I guess, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and, some internal stuff, but it's just, I don't see, once Pentecost happens, I don't see anyone following Jesus in a state of fear. And, and to that point, and I think Daniel Darling brings this up a little bit, there is plenty that the New Testament says about the danger of the world and to remain yeah. pure and untainted from it. But the solution that then is offered to us in the New Testament is not go out and defeat those terrible forces out in the world and make sure you take over the government. It's or, or, uh, or abandon it right. and, you know, pull, pull up the drawbridge and lock yourself back up in the yeah. upper room. Exactly. Neither either. one of those is the right solution. It's again about deepening our communion with Christ, uh, the communion of saints, the practice of the faith. That's, it, it's, a, it's still an internal response rather than an external uh, aggression. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on that, Caitlin? Yeah. There's this little book called People of the Truth uh, by Weber and Clapp that someone introduced me to early in seminary. That's just in general, if you've never read that book, it's really short, but it's so amazing. But there's a line they use consistently throughout the book about the church being a diacritical community. Like we are always critical of something and yet positively advancing something else. You can't kind of cut off one uh, movement of that without losing something foundational about what it means to be the church. And so on one hand, yeah, we're looking at the world 
kind of like it, it does throughout the New Testament. We're looking at the world and saying, you aren't any of these things. Um, you are instead this other thing. And too often we stop at that first thing or we become so obsessed with the second thing that we're missing things that are happening in the world that we need to be critical of. It reminds me of when um, Jesus is talking to the disciples about wanting power and he's like, the Gentiles lorded over them. Not so with you. Instead, you know, if you were to be the greatest, you were to be a servant. It's like, this is a negative thing happening in the world. You are yeah. not supposed to model that. And you, and there's a threat of you modeling it. That's why you have to be against the thing in the world, because the world is not this thing outside of you that we're poking and prodding and criticizing. We are in the world. The world affects us. We, you know, it goes both ways. It's not so easy to define, you know, church versus world. And so be aware of this because this could be you. But then on the flip side, here's the positive vision of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And if we don't have that second part, then there's nothing, we're, we're running on fumes of just being constantly critical. And yet if we're only doing that internal thing, we will be affected by the world in ways we might not expect. And then we will miss out on ways that we need to be disciplined internally. Do we need to be afraid of what the world could do to us? What can I it do? I think we need to be cautious. Eat our children. It could eat our children. See, and that's, that's I, want, I actually want to bring that up because so often that's the motivator of our fear is our children, our children, the next generation. We're losing the next generation. Our kids are going to go, you know, we have to keep our kids safe. And that was so much of the motive for withdrawing from culture in the early 20th century was, you know, we can't send our kids to the colleges anymore. We need to start our own colleges. We, now we can't even send them to the public schools anymore. We need to homeschool them or start our own schools. You know, now we can't even, we can't even send them over to sleepovers with friends from church because we haven't really interviewed the parents at our church to find out if their standards on social media are the same as our standards on social media and our kids will be infected with the world and they're going to ruin. And I'm, I'm just wondering where this, this terror, this kind of parenting terror came from that if you let your kids too far out the front door that i don't know the devil's gonna get them what's what's gonna i, I mean two two questions come to mind number one is i mean just let's say since the emergence of the religious right in the late 70s early 80s where there's this very protectionist kind of mindset and a desire to make sure that the younger generation says how well has that worked out for us because the evidence great. seems to I'm say i'm gonna say great <laughs> The evidence suggests that it isn't the world that is tempting young people away from the faith. It's the church that's driving them away from the faith. Yeah. So that's the first question. And I think I just forgot the second one. Um, <laughs> I don't, I'm losing it at this point in you the can, afternoon. You can, come, you can come up with, okay, I have a point that I, I want to make because I've been listening and reading to, and some of this is from you, Sky. Some of it is uh, from what Mike Erie's been doing on his podcast. Some of it's from what the Bible Project guys, Tim Mackey, are doing on their podcast. Um, you know, in the writings of Scott McKnight and N.T. Wright, and those guys on, you know, when, when did we become so focused on heaven and hell? as as the two things that are together when in the bible it's heaven and earth that are the, are the two things that are always mentioned together and heaven and hell are never mentioned in the same sentence but we we boiled down the gospel to you know you have two choices you're either going to end up in heaven or you're going to end up in hell and choosing jesus and this way of life kind of our way of life is how you end up in heaven and not end up in hell and, and when you, uh, when you kind of deconstruct, I'm going to call that deconstruction. When you deconstruct the gospel and then rebuild it that way as, you know, you're on a road and there's only two places you can end up and you're going to end up in one or the other. So make the right choice. Then the notion that influences from outside your home could get your kids to make the wrong choice. That is legitimately terrifying. You know, so I'm I'm wondering how much of it is this simple, oversimplified, and and frankly questionably biblical gospel that puts heaven and hell as the two things together, um, not heaven and earth and you know new creation and and that whole narrative. If if the narrative became so distorted, using fear of hell as an evangelistic you know, stick to go with the heavenly carrot. And that's how we've attracted several whole generations into the church is, is more fear of hell than, than love of Christ. Um, if that's why we're so frightened for our children and we're so reactive to the world. Huh? Huh? How about that? Yeah. 
I think that fits with what Caitlin was saying earlier, that if, if your narrative is heaven and hell, then you really can't build a church ethic that is for the world. Right. Cause it's just, right. it's, we got to escape it. And man, so you, how do you build that if it's not even part of your vision of the right. Christian the life? world, the world isn't even a player on the field. Right. The world is, yeah. you know, it's, it's you, Jesus, heaven and hell. That's it. And that, that relates to the thought that I couldn't remember earlier, Phil, which is the fear that you're mentioning, the fear of hell. I think one yes. of the, re- one of yeah. the reasons why we've so focused on our children, the next generation is there's really no better way to make a lot of money. As a, as a ministry or as a nonprofit than to tell people, we will help you keep your kids safe. And so the reality of that, the power of that fear and the ability to market that fear means we're going to proliferate that message throughout the Christian right. subculture because it's just the easiest. It's the most precious thing people have and it's the thing they fear losing the most. And so we're going to drive that over and over and over again in our rhetoric. Right, right. I mean, one of uh, one of Dobson's best selling books is simply called Children at Risk, you know, and it, it kind of exemplified conservative Christian parenting in the 90s. And it was a picture of two very blatantly white kind of 1950s dressed children, uh, you know, seven years old each in silhouette, silhouette, but you could tell, you know, what what decade they represented and what race they represented <laughs> on a tightrope. Uh, losing their balance, you know, and obviously where are they going to fall? Hell. They're going to fall into hell. And it was because of Hollywood and the LGBT, you know, agenda and feminism and, you know, all all the usual suspects. I I love that description. I think from now on, Phil, I'm going to describe you as blatantly white. Yes, blatantly white (laughs) and from the 50s. Whereas I'm ethnically ambiguous. You are blatantly white. (laughs) Oh man! Well, it was nice when uh, when Dobson finally retired from Focus on the Family, and so the new president could change the logo because under Dobson they were still running the logo that was the the white family from the 1880s or the, or the 1890s. That what, was, do they have bonnets? You know, no, it was like Paul with a handle with a big curly mustache and you know Ma on, a, on her well, rocking hey, chair. That could be that could be a 21st century family in Portland, Oregon. It could. <laughs> They're either they're either hipsters, they're either hipsters, or it's a little house on the prairie. Yeah, he's just ahead of his time. Choose one, but there was no craft beer. If there's no craft beer, I'm pretty sure it's a little house on the prairie, not not Portland. Uh, do you want to talk briefly about um, Tim Dalrymple's story, or you want to save that for next time? We got like six more minutes. Who are you asking? I'm asking you. I, I don't care. We can talk about it. We can save it. We can. Caitlin, do you have something? I assume you read that piece too. The splintering of the evangelical soul. I did read it. I have more to say about Christian children, though. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Let's, let's go do back that. To, let's do that. Let's go back to Christian children, but only tell me about the blatantly white ones from the fifties. Okay. I just, I, I mean, I went to Liberty, so I was around majority of the people I was around grew up in Christian schools or they were homeschooled. They were on the track of the parenting book in the nineties. That was like, here's how you keep your kids right. safe. To I, keep them safe. I can, keep them safe. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many of them went off the rails while I was at Liberty. And really sadly, I mean, some of that was they finally were free. They went to college, right? They suddenly have no restrictions. They've never learned to make their own decisions outside of their parents' control. So they go kind of off the rails. But more heartbreakingly than that, a lot of people thought they were sending their kids to Liberty and they're going to pop out great Christian, politically conservative people. And they're going to kind of just toe the party line. It's like they've never met an 18 year old. What do you think is going to happen? One, when you're in a really restrictive environment that says this is the only thing you can believe. No, you're not going to believe that. But two, and this is the other part that I wish both Dan and uh, David French's article had talked about, they were in a place where there was so much hypocrisy that of course they left. And I really, I know a, a large amount of people that I went to school with at Liberty who either are not the conservative kind of straight-laced person that they tried to, to pop out, but really more heartbreakingly than that, because a lot of them, a lot of those people are really faithful Christians still. 
I know a ton of people who came to Liberty as Christians who had never been in any other environment and now don't believe anything at all. You know, they've left the faith entirely because they were in this environment that taught them that Christians didn't actually believe the things they learned in their Bible and theology classes because it became evident in their politics that they didn't believe any of those things. And so the part that I would add to both of those other two articles, going back to, to Dan and David French's article, is part of the reason you have to start with the church is not just like Sky said, that's the natural kind of progression that we should be following, but also because if we don't start with the church, we don't have any moral credibility to say anything to the world. So if you want things to change in the world, you Amen. have to deal with yourself first. Um, and we've lost a sense of that. And it's been really heartbreaking, not just to see corruption in the church. That first of all breaks my heart. But then secondly, to see places where Christians could be saying really important things in this moment, and yet we've lost all credibility to do that, that that's our own fault. And we should be mourning that as well, as well as the stuff that's happening inside the church. And, and that's exactly Jesus' point in Matthew 7 about the log and the speck. It's about hypocrisy. Yeah. You cannot have the moral authority to point out the speck in the culture's eye if there's a huge plank of wood in your own. So you're absolutely right, Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin, how did you come through all that with your faith intact or did you, was there a point where, you know, you said, oh, Chuck it, this is dumb. And then you recaptured it. What was, what was your trip through that mess? Really part of it was I had some mentors. I had some people who were at Liberty and yet weren't kind of feeding me the party line about, conservative politics and about what really mattered and were super pragmatic in the way, you know, weren't supporting Donald Trump wholeheartedly in some ways that are really not okay. I had some mentors that were being faithful, but I think more than that, honestly, like I went to public school my whole life. <laughs> so coming to Liberty was a strange Christian environment for me. And I think part of what my parents did in keeping us in church constantly, I mean, we were in the church all the time, but we were also in public school. We were also in military bases. We were also friends with kids in our neighborhood. What it taught me was that the line that divides Christians and non-Christians, people who are oriented toward love of God ultimately, and people who are oriented toward love of self or love of material things, that line doesn't just stop at the edge of the church parking lot. <laughs> like that line cuts through the church, it cuts through the government, it cuts through my school, it cuts through my neighborhood. And I think if you have that sense of like, the lines are not so neatly drawn. So our church can't be this stronghold where we fight, you know, we hide in it and it's us versus them. There are threats inside, there are threats outside, there's problems everywhere. If you have that sense, then I think for me coming to Liberty, I wasn't surprised there was hypocrisy. It broke my heart and it made me want to be different, you know, to live out my faith in a different way politically than I had seen there. But it didn't make me question whether the whole thing was true or not, because I already knew there's going to be faithful people outside of the church. You know, I knew non-Christians in Lynchburg who were doing great things. And I didn't, that didn't threaten my faith to learn that and to learn there were people who were supposed to be Christians at Liberty that were doing really wrong things. And I think that's the lesson that the keep your kids safe thing doesn't end up naturally teaching kids that they really need to learn if they're going to continue to be faithful. Right. Yeah. There's a, there's a wonderful quote from Vaclav Havel who said, the line between good and evil does not run between us and them, but through each person's heart. And that's that protective, conservative, circle the wagons thing is an us versus them conception of good and evil. Whereas the gospel conception, what David French is talking about, is it runs through every person's heart. And what you saw as a young person, I think I did too, Caitlin, was it's complicated. And you shouldn't be surprised to see hypocrisy in the church or in yourself. But that alone should not mean the gospel is uh, wrong. Or right. yeah, so I I, th I think it's really important that we we give our kids, and I'm struggling to do this myself, but to give our kids a more honest depiction of the world and the faith, rather than the antiseptic, these people are good and those people are bad view, because that will blow up in their face the moment they step out of your home. Yeah. And I, uh, Phil's parenting advice. Here's Phil's parenting advice, having now parented and now working, starting to work on another generation of, of messing up some kids. Um, your kids will all go on their own journeys and parts of those journeys will terrify you. And if, if no part of their journey terrifies you, they are not reaching adulthood. 
I mean, they are stuck somewhere on, because if they're moving forward, they're going to move in different directions and they're going to try things out and it'll be different because I'm a rule follower. So m- the things that I wanted to try out were very different than the things my brother wanted to try out that got him arrested, you know, as we mentioned early. Uh, so I was much less likely to get arrested, but I was still tried things out and I still terrified my parents. S- that's part of it. That's part of the journey. So that the, you know, the dad and the Rod Dreher piece who just said, I tried to keep my kids safe and I failed. What did I do wrong? What, what, what you did wrong was thinking that that was the goal was keeping your kids safe. What, what, what you, what you want to do is inspire them with your own life of, of being in love with Jesus so that regardless of how far they wander off and how, you know, bad their journey is, they'll have that light to pull them back in. So when they're tired, you know, when they're, they're sick of the pig slop, when they're sick of the famine in the foreign land, they'll look back and see the love of their mother or their father calling them back, you know, and see that love as a reflection of Jesus because they'll go right through you um, to Jesus if they see Jesus in you. If the Jesus they see in you is afraid of everything on earth, it's not a compelling, it's not even a safe place to want to run back to. Yeah, I w- so. I'd, I'd want to tell that dad in the Roger article to watch Finding Nemo, but I'm pretty sure he's not a Disney Plus subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Isn't that movie all about kind of overprotective <laughs> yeah. parenting and let the it go? To, yeah, let it go, yeah. let it go. I can do this, Dad. No, you can't do this, Nemo. You think you can do these things, but you can't. Dad, I hate you, and I'm going to touch the butt. <laughs> okay, we gotta go. Do we have a guest, Sky? Hey, that was news of the butt. Uh, yeah, we do. <laughs> We have a guest. It's going to be great. Caitlin, thanks for being on the show this week and last week. It was a pleasure to have you here again. Thanks. Yeah, and have a good... uh, When do you graduate? Because we're all going to come to your graduation. The whole listening audience is going to come to your graduation. May 10th. I expect to see all of you. Okay, Okay, we'll be there. We'll totally be there. Okay, cool. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Patreon folks, for supporting us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Helps us pay the bills and and conceive of more stuff we want to do. And we will see you guys next week. Bye. I often share with you new things that I'm writing about in With God Daily, the daily devotional I write for people who hate daily devotionals. But there's another huge aspect of With God Daily that I haven't talked much about, the archives. Supporters don't just get the daily email and audio devotional, they also get access to the With God Daily mobile app with thousands of past devotionals on topics like prayer, idolatry, the cross, the name of God, plus their series from parts of the Bible like the Psalms, Acts, the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus' parables. There's even a series about Vincent van Gogh's faith and paintings. There is so much content there, you could read a Devo every day for years and still not run out. And of course, we're adding new content all the time. Plus, I'll let you in on a little secret, we're working on a completely redesigned version of the With God Daily mobile app to make it even better, with new features and a much better user experience. So if you'd like to have access to that kind of resource, go check out With God Daily today by visiting withgoddaily.com to learn more. It seems like overnight, everyone started talking about deconstructing their faith. Everywhere I turn on social media, there's another Christian saying that they've entered a season of deconstruction. I guess it's just what all the cool kids are doing these days. But what exactly does deconstruction mean? How's it different from just growing up or maturing? And isn't it just rethinking assumptions and coming up with better, more informed beliefs, which is something that we should all be doing if we're serious about following Christ? Well, my guest today has done a lot of thinking about deconstruction because he's worked with a lot of young adults who've grown up in Christian communities, and he thinks there are some really good, healthy ways to deconstruct, which lead to something better, but there are also ways which just blow up everything and leave tons of collateral damage. A.J. Swoboda is Assistant Professor of Bible, Theology, and World Christianity at Bushnell University in Oregon. He also leads a Doctor of Ministry program around the Holy Spirit and leadership at Fuller Seminary. He's the author of a number of books, but his latest book is called After Doubt, How to Question Your Faith Without Losing It. Whether you yourself are in a season of deconstruction or you're trying to lead people who are, I think you're going to really appreciate what AJ has to share on the topic. So here's my conversation with AJ Swoboda.
AJ Swoboda, thank you for joining us on The Holy Post. I am so thankful to be with you this morning, this day. We it is early for you in Portland. So like I said earlier, I'm, I'm just, I'll be excited if you can keep your thoughts straight because I know out West, you probably, you know, drank too much last night and you're up too early. <laughs> well, like we, the we know how the West Coast lives. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I mean, in the the, the Pentecost story, they, they can't believe, they, they think people are drunk at nine in the morning. Uh, they seem to be shocked people could be drunk at nine in the morning. They've clearly never been to Portland. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but I'm not, I'm actually right now in Eugene, which is where I teach at Bushnell University, but I've been in the Pacific Northwest for the last, my, my whole life. So this is, this is home for me. Well, uh, and we talked before we were recording that we haven't seen each other in a couple of years, but we have a lot of mutual friends, including John Mark Homer, who wrote the foreword of your new book, After Doubt, um, which is just stunning. It's a great book. Uh, and that's what I want to talk to you about, just your journey with your own doubts and those who uh, doubt. You served as a pastor for many years. Now you're at a university and you are very well versed in working and walking with people, um, young adults, older folks, people who are coming out of very uh, saturated Christian cultures and into a broader world who begin to question their faith. So one of the key themes of your book is that you're really trying to normalize the process of doubting what does that look like in a community for doubt to be normal? Mm. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great opening question because the, the heartbeat of this book um, is, is actually, I think a bit of a retort. It's a bit of a response to what I perceive to be a fairly unhealthy uh, ideological zealotry on both the right and the left sort of on the right, you have this kind of, uh, doubt is evil, bad, deconstruction is inherently bad, will lead to an abandoned faith sort of approach. Uh, so one side demonizes this conversation, and the other side, kind of on progressive, uh, on the pr progressive side, would say, well, actually, it's required. You have to do this in order to be a true Christian. And so it kind of valorizes doubt and makes it a requirement. Um, and I think both um, are really unhelpful. Um, there, there has to be a third way where we're not trying to get people to doubt, nor are we trying to keep people away from doubt. We're helping people actually find the living God in the middle of it. And so in a, in a way, this is a, an attempt at a third way that, that we don't need to demonize it and we don't need to valorize it, but that we can see it as a legitimate place where God, where God wants to meet us. So let's go a little deeper into the way the, the left and the right think about doubt. Um, Early on in the book, you you have this really helpful paradigm talking about honor-based cultures and uh, what was the other side of the leaving? Le leaving cultures, yeah. Right, right, leaving cultures and honor cultures. Unpack that for us. Explain what that means. And I think as people hear it, they'll be able to immediately go, oh, I totally have existed in this yeah. one or that one. Yes. So unpack that. Well, I began to notice <clears throat> this was after this was after the 2016 election, uh, which at the time I was pastoring a church in Portland. That was just a horrific moment of, of pastoral work. I mean, it was almost untenable to pastor a church through that experience. But I began to note after the the election finished, so many of the parents in the church um, were beginning to ask a lot of questions around how will their kids perceive how they act at this moment in history? Sort of this, that there's this future moment that we're going to look back on and be judged by. And, you know, how will the history books respond to us? How will our kids look at our Facebook feeds and respond to us? <laughs> and in a lot of ways, our moment in, in sort of Western society is so focused on the future and, and what's going to happen. And there's this sort of mythic tell us this mythic moment in the future that's going to look back and judge us. Well, when you contrast that to the, the culture of Jesus's time, uh, honor cultures, it's a very different moment in time because in the past, in the moment of Jesus, everything was about protecting the past and honoring the past and bringing and, 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 and essentially preserving the past. This is why Jesus says uh, a prophet has no honor in his hometown because a prophet would come to his hometown and would challenge it. He would challenge the received tradition. He would challenge the, the past. So in the past, every in honor cultures, everything is about preserving the past. 
I call our culture a leaving culture where everything is about leaving the past. It is about abandoning, unhitching from the past. We're done with right. it. Right. You, you hear people say all the time, you're, you're on the wrong side of history. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And again, there's this, this mythic future that we're apparently going to inevitably get to that's going to look back on us as though we know that's going to happen. Um, but in, in the time of Jesus, a prophet had no honor in his hometown. But today, it's the opposite. In our leaving culture, where everything is about abandoning the past, a prophet has no honor for their hometown. And the idea here is that we now have become a generation of prophets who hate the people who raised us, who hate the environments we came up in. Um, and in particular, when it comes to deconstruction, we are now abandoning our Christian past in order to move to this mythic future. Well, I think, I think that's a dangerous posture to have. I think that that is an unhelpful posture to have. When we unhitch, I mean, I think scripture, I think the Christian story invites us to worship the Alpha and the Omega, the God of our history and the God who calls us into the future. And that there's a danger when we unhitch where we're going from where we came from. So this this relates to um, a psychological or developmental idea, which you again talk about in the book, which is differentiation. Mm. And those who've been in therapy or know something about counseling or family uh, systems will probably be familiar with this idea. But it's something that pretty much all of us at some point have had to go through in some even conscious way as we reach adulthood. And as coming from a, a Christian framing, we are called to honor our mother and our father. Yep. But at the same time, most of us have mothers and fathers who are in some form or another flawed. And we need to differentiate from them or establish our own identity and beliefs. And even in scripture, it talks about a man shall leave his mother and father and cling to his wife, and become one flesh. So what, what wisdom is there from that commandment of honoring our mother and father and yet the need to leave them in order to establish our own identity and, and home? How do you take some of that biblical wisdom and apply it to this idea on a larger scale of honoring the community from which we came from or the faith that we were shaped in without necessarily maintaining all of its baggage and self-differentiating into something yes. else? That's an excellent question. And you you, may, you used a very important word. Everybody has to differentiate. I would say even Jesus differentiated. Oh, you, okay. Let's, uh, how, how exactly did he differentiate from God the Father? Let's get into no, some Trinitarian. From his mother. Now, I, he, right. I, you talk about this. The Trinity... Is is three? I mean, you actually have. We have a word for an undifferentiated Trinity. It's called modalism, and it's called heresy. The fact that we have three persons who are one but distinct, right? Are they're different but they are one? Um, is you know a very important concept in, in Christian history. But even Jesus, when he goes to the wedding in John two, you can tell he's. <laughs> It's differentiating from his mom. His mom is like, hey, pull off this miracle. And he's like, hey, it's not my time. And then eventually he does the miracle because the tension of differentiation, even for God, is hard. You know, even when Jesus is trying to do it, it's difficult. What, how in the world does this matter? Well, this is why it matters. Uh, I, at some point, this story was passed along to me of a young woman who, um, that, that I, had been, I had been serving as a, as, a, as a kind of spiritual mentor for who was raised in a very, 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 very rigid kind of conservative Christian home. And she says, you know, in my Christian home where I grew up, there were no boundaries, no boundaries. My faith was my parents' faith. Everything that I thought was my parents' thought. And she said, the sign that there were no boundaries in my family is that my mom would never knock when she would come into my room. She would just barge in. She would just barge into my room. She would never knock, always barge in. So she goes to college and does what so many people do. Uh, she, you know, took a philosophy class, deconstructed her faith in a year. She was done and, and walked away from her Christian heritage, her Christian faith. Well, you know, after college, she had a kid. And it turns out when you have a kid, you need God because you need somebody to help. And so she starts going back to church and she begins to read her Bible again that she hadn't read for a number of years. And she comes across the line in the book of Revelation where Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And anyone who lets me in, I'll come in and eat with them. And it clicked for her. She all of a sudden saw it, that Jesus has really good boundaries. <laughs> he, he doesn't barge in. He knocks. He honors boundaries. 
And it was actually her recognition that Jesus was inviting himself, not forcing his way in, that actually created the context for her to believe again. My friend Mandy Smith says, you cannot preach the kingdom of God in an empire way. And that means what should be an invitation has become a barging in. And for people who spent their childhood without really being themselves, there's no differentiation. They have to differentiate at some point. And sometimes that's really hard. But Jesus does not barge in. He actually creates profound boundaries for people and knocks. And that that knock is a very different approach than than creating a faith environment where we're never actually given the opportunity to believe on our own. We are forced. Speaking of barging in, January 6th, the insurrection, the attack on the Capitol, (laughs) significant lack of boundaries there. Um, You've walked with a lot of people, students and and people in your ministry who are going through this process of deconstruction. Where does it primarily originate from? Does it originate from a um, a questioning of their community? You know, the the the, the politics, the hypocrisies, the the Trump loving stuff that you probably went through in twenty sixteen. That pe- young people are looking at this, going, "Oh my goodness!" Like I I I, I can't stomach this, which then leads them to question their faith itself, or is it starting from? They're reading the Bible and they're seeing these crazy passages in the Old Testament and they're, you know, questioning the theology and the doctrines of the faith. And then it be, it seeps from there into questioning their community. Is there a generally does it come from one side or the other or is it just a it depends on who you're talking to? Yeah, well, you and I were talking before we began today about, you know, the, the heart of deconstruction and the heart of doubt really makes a big difference here. I mean, I'm I'm struck. Jesus is always asking people, what do you want? You know, in the Gospels, he's always saying, what do you want? What do you want? And it turns out he often gives people what they want, you know, that they actually get what their desire uh, longs for. Um, You know, C.S. Lewis actually says that's what wrath is, is God giving us what we want, you know, that that God allows us to have our desires. And I think there is there, there are two sides to this deconstruction doubt conversation on one side. There, there is the person who is having a, an epistemic struggle with doubt and deconstruction because honestly, they really love Jesus with all their heart and they were handed some ideas that don't reflect Jesus. And the only way that they can keep their faith alive is to go through this process. I mean, if you've been handed a vision that, uh, and if you're a woman and you've been handed a vision of theology that says that you're a footnote in the story of God and, and you're, you're, you don't play an important role, my gut tells me that you're going to need to start thinking through that theology because, because what Jesus thinks about you is very different than what you've been handed about what you think about yourself. There are some people, friends, this guy, I think, who, who, who are going through this process because they really love God and they've been handed some unhealthy ideas about God. But there is another side to deconstruction where it's not really that we love Jesus and, and are struggling to follow him. It's honestly, we just want to sleep around and we're tired of having a book that tells us that we shouldn't. Uh, Or, or, or we, we honestly just are, are, are really excited to be free from having somebody tell us how we should live our life. And honestly, that, that the heart of why we're doing it makes a really big difference. Now to your question about why we're doing it. Well, listen, if you are a if you are a passionate follower of Jesus and you love God with all your heart. And experiences like watching people carrying crosses and Christian uh, flags as as the banner under which they are utilizing their faith to uh, take over our Capitol building. If that doesn't cause you to question your tradition a little bit, um, if your hero, if if you're not impacted by what's, if you've been absolutely transformed by Ravi Zacharias and are not struggling right now to understand what to do when you find out one of your heroes is way more broken than you ever thought they were. Um, if you were handed a theology when you were 16 that says, if you're, if, if you save yourself from marriage, you don't have sex and you do everything right, you're gonna have a perfect marriage. And you all of a sudden go off and get married, married and figure out it's a lot harder than they told you. If, if you love God, those things are going to cause you to question a lot of the ideas that you have. Again, it goes back to the heart. Do we desire to follow Jesus with all of our lives or do we really just want what we want? Amen. Uh, I mean, as we talked about before we were recording, that is 
that was very much my experience as a teenager and young adult. Um, I began questioning everything, both theologically and certainly culturally, about some of the evangelical Christianity that I had known. But the end result was I found a more compelling, beautiful, and ravishing Jesus than I had started with. So it it led me into a far deeper, uh, more grounded faith rather than a weaker a weaker one. And so when I, w- with my own kids or when I encounter somebody who is quote unquote deconstructing their faith, and I, I sense it's coming from that true desire to want to know God more, more yeah. deeply and truly, I get excited. I think it's a wonderful, painful, but wonderful process. Yes. Okay. Can, oh, I, can I respond to that briefly, Sky? Because yeah. I mean, there, I think anybody listening to this has had this experience where you're on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, and you see sort of the classic deconstruction post, you know, that, that we see, you know, I'm going through, I'm deconstructing, sure. I'm, I'm deconverting, so on and so forth. And what's really interesting when you come, I've probably seen a hundred of these. It's like, there's a Google doc somewhere that everybody's copying and pasting. Cause there's honestly, <laughs> they have the same, stru- the same stuff involved. I'm not minimizing those things. I'm saying there's some consistent themes. Well, I'm not by the way, convinced that the kind of I'm not convinced all the time that the Christianity people say they're deconstructing is actually Christianity. Right. I mean, I, my wife and I, this is, I love thinking about it this way. My wife and I grow tomatoes. We live here in Oregon and we grow these just godly tomatoes in the summer. I mean, these tomatoes are proof of God good. And when we grow these tomatoes, it is common in the summer. We'll have somebody come over to our house for dinner and they'll say, I don't like tomatoes. And I'll say, we haven't had our tomatoes and we'll serve them our tomatoes. And they'll say, oh my gosh, I love tomatoes. And you all of a sudden learn People don't hate tomatoes. They hate fake tomatoes. Right. And I think, honestly, what a lot of people are deconstructing is not authentic Christianity. It's fake religion. And if that's what you're deconstructing, go for it, baby. Get to Jesus. I mean, that's that's essentially what my book with was about. Um, That my argument was a lot of people are walking away from the faith because they've never really experienced the real faith. And I'm not going to grieve that. Um, I'm not going to grieve that they're walking away. Okay, so uh, let me let me uh, give you a practical question. I get a ton of emails from people, and I generally ignore them until <laughs> because I just don't have time. Until my wife says, "Sky, you need to sit down and re- start responding to some of these emails." And that happened last night. She she took my daughter to basketball practice, and she said, "Before I come home, you need to respond to at least just six emails." <laughs> So I sat down with the, the emails and I responded to more, to more than, I spent about two hours responding to emails, but at least half of them, at least half of them were people in this, wow. in this dynamic, right? Of deconstruction or I'm struggling with my faith or whatever. And there were a few that stood out to me because uh, they confessed to holding on to their faith, struggling deeply with their community, whether their church or you know family, whatever it is, and struggling with anger. Mm. Because they feel like they've come to a truer, deeper sense of Christ in their life and and shed some of the baggage of religion or, or just cultural Christianity that they've grown up with. But the people around them are desperately clinging to it or actually upset with them for challenging, you know, the prophet in his hometown stuff. And and they were they were angry and they're like, I know this anger isn't good. What do I do? Because I don't have anybody in my life that is thinking the way I'm thinking now or sees things the way I see them. Put your pastor hat back on. How would you have responded to those who are in this process and are struggling with anger toward those who aren't in the process? Yeah, man. And by the way, thank you for answering your emails. I'm glad. Yeah, I think I seven of those were from me. So thank you for your <laughs> response to, to, to my faith quandaries. Um, yeah, man, what a profound question. And again, if you if there's anybody listening to this who wrestles with how to serve people in the midst of doubt and deconstruction, you are meeting people in the midst of their dark night of the soul. And what you give them at that moment is very important. And if we give them trite, cliche, bumper sticker theology, uh, it will push them further and further away. I think two things stand stand kind of stand out in my in my spirit as you ask that question. The first is that we need to be as leaders in the church, as leaders of Christian communities, we need to practice what I have come to call spiritual consent. And what that means is that before I respond to somebody who is laying down anger or frustration or doubt or deconstruction, 
when I have a student sitting in my office who's just pouring their soul out and they come to the point where they're done, I was trained immediately. You jump in and you give answers. But I have learned in an environment where people don't have boundaries that actually the first thing to do is to stop, pause, and simply say, how are you inviting me to respond? And that simple word invites the person to allow you into what they're hoping for. And if they're saying, I need answers and help, then give answers and help. But sometimes, honestly, people who are angry just need someone to hear their anger. And they are not looking for a trite piece of advice. They need an ear. The second thing that immediately comes to mind is this was pointed out to me uh, by a colleague at uh, Fuller Seminary where I teach uh, a doctor of ministry program. <clears throat> I was uh, pointed out that in the, um, in the mainline tradition in particular, you know, we have a number of Psalms, right? All these different kinds of Psalms. And one of the Psalms that we, we've got, you know, uh, psalms that are about, that are praises. We've got Psalms that are Thanksgiving Psalms. We've got Messianic Psalms. We've got all these Psalms. And there's this whole version of Psalms called imprecatory Psalms, which are Psalms of rage and anger. Yeah. And it was pointed out to me that uh, in lectionary readings in church gatherings for years, the last 40 or 50 years, they've actually removed the imprecatory Psalms from public readings. They don't read them anymore. And the reason they don't read them anymore is that they're just too scary to read out loud. They're too honest. They're, they're ra- and because they express radical rage. Now, there's no evidence that David, who wrote some of these, went out and actually killed his enemies or did the things that he always, but he expressed that anger. Right. And when you look at, I mean, this summer, when I was, my, when my friends were at the Black Lives Matter movements here in Oregon, when we were dealing with the George Floyd, pro- uh, all the, everything that followed up with George Floyd, the George Floyd protests, I just kept coming back to this, that there is so much anger in the streets because there has been no anger in the church. Hmm. And I think one of the greatest gifts we give to the world is to get mad about things that God gets mad about. And when you're walking through anger, you need those imprecatory Psalms are such a gift to know that your emotions are permitted in your worship does not mean that you're going down and blowing windows out and hurting people. But friends, we've got to take our anger somewhere. And the Bible invites us to bring it to God. If I don't, if I don't take my anger to God, I'm going to take it to Twitter. I need to take it somewhere. So that what are, concept, those imprecatory Psalms for the person in anger, are they are as important as Psalm 23. <laughs> they are as important. So what about, how is that done properly because I mean, anger is a gosh it's a it's a, it's a powerful a, thing it's a very powerful thing and i and i totally affirm what you're saying about the psalms i mean in my view the psalms give you the full spectrum of the human divine relationship in all of its facets and we've tended to eliminate many of those facets as illegitimate or un unchristian or whatever and so we ignore them on the other hand i'm thinking of the sermon on the mount where jesus warns about anger yes right so uh, and Paul says, do not let the sun go down on your anger, right? It's not that anger in itself is inherently wrong, but it is very dangerous. Yes, it is actually, for G- sorry to interrupt. Sorry. No, go ahead. But but when you look at Matthew 5, when Jesus talks about anger, he actually is using a, a progression. He starts with, you know, if you have anger, and then if you curse someone, and then if you completely write them off, it's actually right. a progression. And I think what he's saying, he doesn't say if you get anger, you're going to go to hell. He says, you're in danger. Of the, of, of the power. And I think his point is that anger can be a trajectory that leads to, leads to very dark places. But you have to balance that with the fact that you have 20 or 30 psalms that are imprecatory psalms that give voice to rage and anger. So it's, again, I think you're right. Anger is not a problem. God gets angry in the Bible. We're creating God's image. It is when ang- the difference between when I am controlled of my anger and when anger controls me. And something dangerous happens when we move to a place where our emotions control us. And by the way, somebody is, I was just yesterday talking to somebody about this. Somebody has got to write a dissertation at some point or a book on the impact social media has on our theology. And the reason is when those emotional experiences of seeing injustice in the world, of seeing wrong, of seeing 
you know, a world of profound diversity, more and more and more, I'm seeing that things like social media actually cause us to change our theology for emotional purposes. That's a dangerous trajectory. When we begin to follow our emotions over the word of, of God, over what God has said in scripture, we need to feel the emotions, but don't follow the emotions. Oh, well, I mean, you're right. That's a whole dissertation. There's a lot to unpack there. Very much there. Uh, in, in the minutes we have left, at least in this part of the conversation, I want to talk about, let's go back to what you said about we are sort of a leaving culture, right? A, a culture in which the new is always preferred over the traditional and questioning everything is great and throwing off the shackles of, of beliefs and norms is great. Um, what's his name? Charles, uh, Charles Taylor's talked about how doubt is just pervasive in the modern secular society. So here's my question though. As I read that whole part in your book, I was thinking to myself, okay, is, is the problem that we doubt too much now, or is it actually in some communities that we, we doubt too little? And, and I mean that on both ends of the spectrum, because at least in recent events in America, it seems like certainty has become way more dangerous than uncertainty. Yeah. It's the people who are absolutely sure that they're right about fill in the blank who are the ones storming the Capitol or the ones who are willing to take up arms against their neighbors or, you know, whatever the political issue may be. So what, what's the danger of, of certainty as opposed to the danger of too much doubt? Yeah. Wonderful question. I actually think the answer to that is found in the, in the, in the narrative of Thomas in, in John 20. I mean, we, we call him doubting Thomas, but I, you know, in the new Testament, he's never called that. That's sort of a, we would put that on him, which is a really unfortunate name. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of the disciples had unfortunate names. Sons of Thunder, Thomas, the, Matthew, the tax collector. We got all these names. But anyways, so Thomas, the, the, the irony of Thomas's story is we call him Doubting Thomas. But I actually think the better name would be something like Certain Thomas. And here's why. He cannot believe and have faith in the resurrection because he's certain what he's seen. He, he even says, he says, I, if, if, if I can touch his, if I can touch his hands, if I can touch the, 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 the hole in his side, then I'll believe. Now there was a book written years ago by a guy named Michael Polanyi. He wrote a book called uh, personal, uh, personal knowledge. He was a scientist. The, the premise of this book is really directly relates to Thomas. And that is Polanyi argued that any act of scientific certitude at the end of the day, requires profound faith. You have faith in your instruments. You have faith in the system. You have faith in the scientific method. You have faith in your advisor. You have faith in the people you work with. That any act of scientific certitude is an act of faith. And I don't think the issue is either, all, is, is either faith or reason. I think it is always faith and alternative faith. Right. And in and, a way... And, it's helpful for exactly. people to think of faith to think of faith as what you're putting your trust in. That's you're putting exactly your trust right. in something. That's exactly right. Yeah. An act of certitude can more often than not actually be simply our faith in ourselves. We don't have we're not called to have faith in our faith. We're called to have our faith in Jesus. And to have your faith in Jesus means you're not leaning on your certitude about Jesus. You're leaning on Jesus. And the minute we begin to have faith in our faith, we have a word for that. It's called idolatry. We are placing our faith in ourselves over the living God. And the minute you start going down that road, it's a whole lot easier to believe your ideology uh, more than it is to believe in Jesus. What you've just described there sounds an awful lot like a a workable definition of fundamentalism. And I don't just mean Christian fundamentalism. I mean any form of fundamentalism. There's secular fundamentalism. It's it's that certitude that I am right, therefore I can justify any attitude, action, judgment, or behavior because it's it's confidence in myself or in my my community. Um, and, and that's why, in my view, like fundamentalism at its heart is a form of idolatry. 
Yeah, one hundred percent. You you just quoted Jonathan Haidt, by the way, and you you quoted the righteous mind. Uh, uh, either when we were before, we we talked about Jonathan Haidt a bit, yeah. uh, at least interpersonally. And the whole premise of Jonathan Haidt's work is that we um, have become righteous minds who think we're all right and everybody's wrong. And I I would I think I'm going to write a book called Healing the Righteous Mind: Christ's Cure for Human Arrogance. Because there is, in my mind, no, there is no idea more powerful for humility than the gospel. Because it says, in the words of Paul, let every man be a liar and God be true. It is actually the idea that the gospel invites us to embrace our wrongness and to recognize above all, Jesus is right. And all men, all women are liars, but he is true. It is a reorientation. To be a Christian is to mean I don't have to be right because Jesus is right. It's, it is so freeing to not have to defend the truth tooth and nail to protect your own pride because your pride has died. I am dead with Christ. Yeah, in um, in my daily devotional right now, we've been going through John fourteen, and of course, verse six is well known. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it's it's fascinating that he identifies himself as the truth rather than a set of doctrinal statements or propositions. And I, I think that's what separates a, a genuine faith from one that is just an inherited set of traditions. Right? It's I. It's the difference between I believe in these things and I believe in this one. Yes, this person, yes. yes, and that does bring enormous humility and uh, and a willingness to respect boundaries, like you mentioned with the people who come into your office and asking them how how are you inviting me to respond or Jesus at the door and knocking. Um, it's when you believe in a propositional set of truths that you say, "Oh, I've got this this um, pass to barge into your room and tell you what the truth is," yeah. <laughs> and that's uh, just so foreign to our faith. All right, we're we're about out of time in this conversation, but I want to really. Uh, affirm the book you've written. This is just a, a beautiful resource, not only for those who are walking through that season of, of questioning and deconstruction themselves, but man, I would recommend this for anybody who's responsible for caring for or leading other souls, a youth pastor, a, a teaching pastor, any pastor or parent or teacher or somebody who is having these encounters and conversations with people struggling. It is, it's a thoughtful, um, reflective guide. And it's, it's, it's more than just a list of advice. It's it, it's real wisdom. It offers real perspective. So AJ, thank you so much for writing it. Um, before you go, though, you're going to stick around and we're going to record a bonus conversation for our Patreon folks. Because a few years ago, you left your pastoral ministry to begin a different kind of ministry as a professor. And you learned a lot in the process. And as I mentioned, I'm getting emails from people all the time. I know you are interacting with folks who are in ministry roles who are really struggling right now because of COVID, because of all this deconstruction, because of culture and political battles, um, wondering if they're going to still have a job in ministry. And having walked that road out of pastoral ministry, you, you've gained some wisdom on that as well. So we're going to talk about that in our bonus segment. And if you're a Patreon supporter, thank you so much for keeping the Holy Post going. Uh, definitely check out this extra conversation that AJ and I are going to have and maybe even pass it along to someone in your life who is in ministry and struggling with it. AJ, any final thought for those who are in uh, a process of deconstructing their faith, whether a healthy way mm-hmm. or an unhealthy one? Well, yeah. Just, thank you, Sky, for having me and for hosting this conversation. I just, I have come to believe that, you know, the, one of the greatest prayers in the Bible, we, we don't have a sinner's prayer in the Bible. We don't have a sinner's prayer, but we do have a doubter's prayer. Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. And I, I would say to anybody who's listening to this, who is walking through these experiences, Tell God about it and invite him into the process. You're not alone. Tell God, I believe. (laughs) I just really am struggling with some unbelief. Tell God. He listens. Amen. AJ, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Sky. It's a gift. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Phil Vischer Enterprises, that's Phil's company, and Sky Pilot Media, that's Sky's company. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. 
Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, and more. 